and welcome to Just One More Watch. So, you started off with a Seiko 5, perhaps bought a couple of homages to see how they looked and felt, then into the wonderful world of micro brands, and before you knew it, you'd picked up your first Swiss watch, perhaps a Tissot, maybe a Hamilton, and now you're looking at your watch box and your bank balance and wondering, is it time for your first luxury watch? Today, I'm gonna have a look at what I think could well be a great choice for many people taking that step, the Tudor 1926. It's a slightly odd watch from Tudor. It was released a couple of years ago, didn't get a huge amount of fanfare or appreciation at the time, despite the fact that it is their cheapest watch by a margin. Plus, it's available in so many different case sizes and dial colors that you're almost guaranteed to find one that fits you and you like the look of. But I think if we're gonna answer the question today, is this the perfect first luxury watch? We need to do three things. First, we need to define what we mean by a luxury watch, which is not going to be easy. Then we need to look at the watch itself and see if it stacks up for the money that they're charging, regardless of any labels that we might attach to it. And finally, we need to look at what else is available for the same money by similar brands and see how it compares. Now, I did not just buy one of these. It is kindly on loan to the channel from Sydney local Peter. Peter loaned me his Bull of a Lunar Pilot a couple of weeks ago. He actually used to work for Tudor and has a number of Tudors in his collection. He therefore has decided to let this one go. If you watch the video and like what you see, maybe you can give it a new home. I'll leave Peter's email in the description of the video. You can contact him directly about it. Thanks for the loan of another cracking watch, Peter. So what is a luxury watch? Is this Tudor the perfect first example thereof? Let's flip the camera and find out. So what is a luxury watch then? Let's consult the Oracle. And you can see here that according to Google, luxury watches vary from $50,000 Breguet tourbillons to IWCs, Frederick Constance and fairly nasty looking Richard Mille copies and Swarovskis. Nothing conclusive for us there then. There are, however, no shortage of lists such as this one by Lux Digital, offering definitive rankings of the world's best luxury watch brands. Perhaps our answer will be here. The top few entries all seem reasonable, but once you start looking down the list, it's not hard to spot the companies who have paid to be on the list. Norgreen at number nine. Perhaps Norgreen, Vincero and Liv are luxury watches in a parallel universe, but not in the one that you and I inhabit. So let's go back to basics then and define the word luxury. I think we'll get somewhere there. Involving great expense, a rarely obtained pleasure, and inessential. I think that's important to acknowledge. Any watch over and above the most basic quartz timepiece is to an extent inessential and therefore a luxury watch. If Karl Marx, the father of communism, had been around today, I have no doubt he would have worn a Casio F91W, seeing no need for anything more bourgeois than that. And indeed, I came up with my own definition of luxury in a video a few years ago when I still had some pigmentation in my hair. I questioned whether is luxury a spurious construct created by marketeers to keep us on an endless consumerist treadmill. So be aware, if you weren't already, that when you buy something labelled as a luxury item, you're buying something that is necessarily expensive and inessential. Plenty to think about today then. But what about Tudor? Do people regard them as a luxury watch brand? Damn right they do. Tudor was founded back in 1926, the year referenced by this very model, by Hans Wilsdorf, the founder of Rolex. They were designed as a sister brand and have for many years shared parts and or manufacturing facilities with their elder sibling. And with the recent repositioning of Rolex from an affordable luxury brand to something basically unobtainable, Tudor has now very much slipped into the market position that Rolex used to occupy. This has led to many people turning their back on Rolex in favor of Tudor. Now, there are no shortage of homemade tier lists that attempt to situate the plethora of luxury watch brands in some kind of order. Most of them feature Tudor alongside the likes of Tag Heuer, Oris, Longines, and Rado. Though I'm not quite sure I've ever seen a finer oxymoron than basic luxury. For me personally, I think Tudor sits a little higher and has as much brand cachet in 2023 as the likes of Chopard, Breitling, and IWC. And I'm not just saying that because I own one, honestly. So if a luxury watch is an inessential pleasure that comes at great expense, a watch by Tudor definitely qualifies. 
So, on to the 1926. What great expense is associated with the purchase of one of these? Well, they start at just under 2,000 US dollars after recent price hikes. That's just under 3,000 Aussie for me. And as mentioned, there are numerous different sizes. A small 28, one would assume for the ladies, a more unisex 36, a 39 and a 41, all available in various different colourways as well, all on leather or bracelet. I counted 104 different permutations available on Tudor's website. That is impressive slash ridiculous for a single model. This is the one that Peter went for, a 41 mil with a full stainless steel bracelet and gold hands and indices. Now there are a couple of versions, I guess the all black or the white with blue, that are a little bit sportier than this one, but all 1926 models do veer towards dressy rather than overtly sporty. As such, there is an air of uh, maturity about this Tudor, shall we say. The case is all high polished and it has a complex seven link bracelet, again with plenty of high polish. Having said that, the watch does have a screw down crown and 100 meters of water resistance, so there's no reason why you couldn't wear this one all day, every day, as a sports style watch if you wanted to. The only Gada box left unticked is the loom. Those delicate leaf hands do not feature any, and neither do those arrowhead indices and numerals. It's a good looking watch nonetheless. I mean, does this look like a luxury watch to you? Because it sure looks like a luxury watch to me. The waffle style checkerboard patterning is really nice, especially when you get close to it, as you can see from some of these macro shots. And personally, I'm delighted to see rotor self winding the old smile dial back in position above the six. For once, it's some superfluous dial text that actually adds charm and character rather than just adding unnecessary clutter. Now, sizing will obviously vary depending on which version you opt for, and all versions apparently wear quite large for their diameter dimension. So don't be frightened of considering a watch slightly smaller than you normally would. This 41 is very wearable on me, but I'd be looking at the 39 or perhaps even the 36 if I was going to run one of these as a daily. Two key points to note on screen, thickness of only 9.4 millimeters. That's not a lot for an auto with 100 meters. And I'll show you just how slim that is when I get it on wrist shortly. And the movement, a Tudor Caliber T601, which sounds in-house, doesn't it? Indeed, Tudor makes some fantastic in-house movements. But for two grand, you ain't getting one. What you are getting is a Salita SW200. Now, there's no shame in putting a Salita in an entry-level luxury watch. I have bought numerous Auris for large piles of cash featuring exactly that movement. And Auris do the same thing and sneakily brand theirs as an Auris caliber, blah, blah, blah. From the Tudor website, it at least looks like it's a high-grade version with plenty of decoration and a custom rotor. And on the time grapher, Peter's performed at a perfectly acceptable level, coming in at around minus four to five seconds per day whilst flat on its back. Case finish is very simple, as noted, all high polished, quite a flat case, which backs up what I was saying about these watches wearing large, but super slim, as you can see. The screw down crown is small, but perfectly serviceable and features the Tudor shield on it. The bracelet is very nice, a mixture of a very fine brush and polish and with a lovely taper. In this case, all the way down from 22 to 18. You can see that taper occurs gently over five separate links, which I really like. The clasp is okay, although it doesn't feature the Tudor shield, which is slightly disappointing. And it features no half links and no micro adjustments. So chances are you're gonna be wearing this one loose. Another reason I think to consider a smaller size. But even in this large 41 plus, it still wears very nicely on my seven inch wrist. Flat, but really slim, surprisingly slim. It's not often that I encounter a watch under a centimeter thick. The dial is covered by flat sapphire, which is definitely a factor in that lack of girth. I guess it also saves a few dollars, but I'm not convinced there's a lot of anti-reflective undercoating in use here. As discussed, it veers towards dressy rather than sporty, so it's not much of a problem. But it's not so dressy, I don't think, that you couldn't rock this one with shorts and t-shirts, exactly as I'm doing now, exactly as I always do. Overall then, I like it. The dial is really nicely done, with enough there to keep you interested, but not so much that it looks fussy. It has a date complication, again enhancing its daily wear capabilities, and it has the biggest draw of all on the dial, the word Tudor. I say it again, in many ways, Tudor have become what Rolex used to be, a brand that is both aspirational, yet still relatively attainable. There is an irony then that I have seen and heard stories of a number of these being flipped very quickly by people who have bought them as part of a, in inverted commas, package at their local Rolex dealer. 
hey, if you buy a 1926, we'll also sell you the Datejust or whatever it is that you really want. I think that's a bit of a shame because this watch has plenty to offer in its own right. Great brand, well made, easy to wear, handsome, five year transferable warranty and easy to service because of the familiar movement architecture. But finally, how does it compare to the competition? Well, what is the competition? Let's bring back in one of those tier lists. Let's look across that basic luxury line. Sure, there are plenty of great watches around $2,000 from the likes of Zinn and Ball, but I wouldn't necessarily compare them directly to this Tudor. Alpina and Youngins don't really make anything in this dress sport category. I think therefore the 1926's biggest competition comes from Oris, Maurice Lacroix and Longines. The Oris Atelier comes in at 500 Aussie dollars cheaper than the Tudor. It has a texture dial, a date and the same Salita, but a lower grade thereof. It's also really, really boring. The Maurice Lacroix Icon definitely has more to it design-wise, coming in at a similar price. In a broad range of colours, it has a pattern dial, a date, and a similarly off-the-shelf movement. The Longines record looks remarkably similar to the 1926, with its numeral evens, arrowhead odds, date complication, and seven-link bracelet. But it has a superior chronometer-grade movement, and it's a lot cheaper coming in at two grand Aussie, as opposed to nearly three grand Aussie for the equivalently sized Tudor. But weren't luxury watches supposed to be expensive, rarely obtained pleasures? I'd much rather have the Tudor than any of those alternatives with any change in my back pocket. I think the current overwhelmingly positive sentiment around Tudor as a brand more than justifies spending the extra money on one of these. It's likely to hold its value better as a consequence as well. Perhaps it's not the perfect first luxury watch because of the lack of bracelet adjustment and the lack of loom on the hands, but if you accept those as dressy limitations, it would make a very, very nice first luxury watch for most people, I have no doubt. So there you have it, the Tudor 1926. Expensive? Yeah, but it's supposed to be, right? Worth it? Probably, if you have the budget for it and you want a really attractive all-rounder with a fantastic brand name on the dial. Thanks again to Peter for the loan. If you don't fancy this one but want a really attractive all-rounder with a fantastic brand name on the dial, click here for one more expensive than the Tudor or here for one less expensive than the Tudor. Thanks for watching, I will see you all again in a future video, I hope.